Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this session of the ICN. Uh, we are beginning with uh, the talk by Jennifer Chais from UC Berkeley. This talk is already recorded. And since it's already for 45 minutes, um, I'm supposed to tell everybody that there's no time for questions. And so let's begin. It's a pleasure to have Jennifer Chase recorded session from UC Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. And she'll speak on graphons and graphics as limits and models of large sparse graphs. Welcome. Hello, thank you for inviting me to the ICM. I'm going to be talking about graphons and graphexes, both as limits and as models of large sparse graphs. However, I'm going to start by reviewing dense graph convergence, then convergence for sparse graphs of unbounded de degree, and then I will give you a new way of looking at this, different from the way we had done it for the first decade or so. I'll start off with a primer on exchangeability. Then I will reformulate what we call left convergence for dense graphs. So going back and redoing what we had done previously in the earlier parts of the lecture. I'll, um, I'll define something called sampling convergence and show how these new objects, graph X's, are completions of sparse graphs. Then I'll mention the identifiability problem for Christian, them and how we tell me my speech. So graph limits. Um, heuristically, you can take the adjacency matrix of a graph, for example, the half graph, and you can view it on the grid, uh, on the unit grid, with 1 over n blocks for the n um, for the n vertices. And you can say that if two vertices are connected, then I'm going to color it black, and otherwise I'm going to leave it blank. And I'll take a limit of that, which will look kind of like this picture that we're seeing here. I can do that for the random graph, and I just get a grayscale. But what about permutations of these vertices? For example, the two graphs shown here are just permutations of the vertices. And what we showed with Latsi Lovas, we being Christian Borgs and I, the B you'll see is always Christian Borgs, um, is that the, the function that you get on the right is unique up to measure preserving bijections. So the analog of of the permutation symmetry on the graph is measure preserving bijections for this function w on the unit square. So uh, how do we get, how do we precisely define a kind of convergence for dense graphs? And in fact, this work began by considering many different notions of convergence for dense graphs and coming up with notions that were sufficiently robust that they didn't have everything converged to the same point, nor everything converged to a different point, but instead were equivalent to each other. So we can test a large graph by studying maps from a small set K into the vertex set of that graph. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define the homomorphism density of some small graph F into that graph as the probability that a random map on k vertices is a homomorphism. And we say that a sequence of dense graphs is left convergent or subgraph convergent if these densities converge. So basically what you're seeing is the density of an edge, the density of a triangle, the density of a force cycle of a Peterson graph, and every other finite graph converge. There's another notion that we came up with, which seems much more, uh, uh, much more global, which we call right convergence. So here we're going to test a large graph by mapping its vertex set into a small set K and considering weighted multi-way cuts. So given K different species of particles, let's say, and a function j, which represents uh, the connection between 
a red particle and a blue particle or a red and a green or any of the n choose two combinations, I'm going to define the microcanonical ground state energy of the graph to be the, um, the sum of the j's over all vertices in the graph using the weights from this model, the, the weights j. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a sequence of dense graphs is right convergent if this energy converges for all k and for all j. So with these two, what is a graph limit? Well, in the first case, it's a collection of probability distributions on finite graphs, you know, an edge density, a Peterson graph density, etc. In the right convergence case, it's a collection of microcanonical ground state energies. I'm going to say that a graph on over a sigma finite measure space is an integrable symmetric function. And I'm going to say that the empirical graph on of a graph on n nodes, so if I'm just given a graph, I'm going to, which is, is on n nodes, it's going to be like those first pictures, I'm going to divide the unit square into n squared 1 over n blocks, and I'm going to set w equal to 1 if those two edges are connected to each other. And I'm going to equip it with the uniform measure. And of course, any finite graph can be written as a piecewise constant graph on just coloring in the blocks. Okay, so we all like metrics. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say that a dense graph, I'm, I'm, I'm going to define a metric here. So if um, W1 and W2 are defined over the same measure space, I'm going to look at the difference between W1 and W2 and think about taking the max cut in all ways that I can, breaking bonds between subset S and a subset, let's say, S complement on that graph. And if W1 and W2 are defined on the same or also on different spaces, we say that the cut metric is the inf over all measure preserving bijections of this. And we say a sequence of graphs converges to a graph on in the cut metric if it's empirical graphs converge, in empirical graph ons converge. So it turns out, and this is with a whole series of papers with Christian Borgs, Lotsi Lovas, Varashoj, and Kadi Vestragambi, that a sequence of graphs is a Cauchy sequence in the cut metric if and only if it's left convergent, which seemed very local, and right convergent, which seemed pretty global. Um, uh, Lovas and Segetti, and as it was pointed out earlier, by, uh, later by Tim Austin and uh, Diaconis and Janssen, this, this would have followed from about a 1980 result of Aldous and Hoover. Um, the, um, there, there does exist a limiting graph on. And then it turns out for dense graphs, left, right, metric, and many other notions are equivalent to each other. The microcanonical free energies we've talked about, uh, convergence of max cuts and min bisections, convergence of quotients, which are related to semi partitions of the graph, or with David Gamarnik, we also looked at convergence of a large deviations rate function on the graph corresponding to entropies. And for dense graphs, all these notions are equivalent to each other. Now we turn to sparse graphs of unbounded de degree. For sparse graph sequences, the limit as defined previously is just zero. So uh, that's not very useful. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna normalize W by its L1 density so that the L1 norm becomes one. I'm gonna call that the rescaled graph on. So what we're essentially doing there is we're taking that unit square and we're renormalizing it so that the um, the weights get much bigger than the, the the weights get much bigger, and then we say it's convergent if there's a graph on that it converges to in this way. 
And under suitable regularity conditions, it turns out to be equivalent to right convergence, that is convergence of microeconomical free energy. For sparse graph sequences, I could also do something else. I could stretch the underlying unit square so that it becomes the upper quadrant, which here, because of perspective, is shown as the lower left quadrant. And what I'm going to do there is I'm going to take the norm of my function and I'm going to stretch my metric by the square root of that in each direction. And I'm going to say that it's conversion in the stretch metric if I have a sequence which scales like this approaches some w. And this is equivalent to a modified version of left convergence under suitable regularity conditions. So the problem is that without extra technical conditions, mass can disappear up for rescaled graphons or to infinity for stretched graphons. Let's go back and look at this picture. OK, we can't, but that's fine. And we don't get subsequential convergence for arbitrary sequences. So the solution is to develop a theory for sequences which obey notions of regularity which rule out pathological sequences. We define a notion of upper regularity for rescaled graphons and uniformly regular tails for the stretched graphons. And can we get a sequence which converges in both senses, which combines the advantages of both definitions? And what sparsity can we achieve? Well, it turns out that, and this is work with, um, so I guess I had talked about before, work with Yufei Zhao. Now this is work with Nina Holden, and in both cases with Henry Cohn and Christian Borgs, who appears, I think, as a co-author on all these papers. So if, if something converges both um, from the rescale graphons and from the stretch graphons, it turns out it can only be dense. And if either of them converge, then it turns out that you have um, divergent average, um, divergent average uh, 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 degrees in your graph sequence. The advantages of the rescaling notion are that the random graph as well with pn with with p scaled by 1 over n as well as sparse power law graphs converge it's equivalent to right convergence under an assumption of uniform upper regularity and in fact it can be related to estimation in ways i'm not going to go through in this talk the advantage of the second definition is it gives convergence for very long tails turns out that this notion of left convergence can be generalized to sparse graphs, which you'll see later in the lecture, under the assumption of uniform tail regular and under the assumption of uniform tail regularity, it's equivalent to stretch metric convergence. Also, extending the notion of graphons to graph X's, we get subsequential convergence without the assumption of uniform tail regularity. And I'll define this for you in terms of a graphon process later in the lecture. Okay, let me give you a little primer on exchangeability. This is, of course, something that all of you know, but generalizing it, it will help to have this primer first. So an exchangeable sequence, we say that an infinite sequence, x1, x2, et cetera, is exchangeable if and only if for any finite n and any distinct finite sequences i1 up through i and j1 up through jn the two subsequences so i pick x2 x5 x8 so on have the same joint probability distributions so in other words the labels don't really matter here if we have identif if an identically distributed sequence is independent, then it's clearly exchangeable, but not vice versa. Think of a polyarm. And in 1937, 
Diffinetti had a brilliant and surprising at the time insight, and it's still surprising when you present the poll you earned to students for the first time, that exchangeable sequences are not that far from independent. In particular, when conditioned on a parameter, which is a random variable measurable with respect to the sigma algebra and infinity, they are independent, okay? They are conditionally independent. So Diffinetti's theorem says that an infinite sequence is exchangeable if and only if it turns out there exists a probability measure on zero one such that the sequence can be generated as follows. First, we choose some parameter p according to this measure mu. And second, we choose xi iid Bernoulli on zero one with parameter p. And of course then, as, as we know, the probability of x1 and is, is, is just p. Okay, so p, p makes it feel like an independent sequence. And moreover, p can be written as a random variable, which is measurable with respect to the sigma algebra at infinity. So is there an analog of Diffinetti for arrays corresponding to dense graphs? And that's the Aldous-Hoover theorem. So let me tell you, oh, and how about arrays corresponding to sparse graphs with divergent, with divergent degrees? And this is what I'm going to be telling you about later in the lecture. This does correspond in some way to the stretch graph. So exchangeable arrays. Now we're moving from sequences to arrays. And the, the arrays are really dense graphs. Okay, so an infinite array is said to be jointly exchangeable. If I take any finite n and any permutation on the sequence of n indices and this has the same joint probability distribution. Okay, so all finite, per, all finite permutations of the rows and the columns. And an infinite random graph is exchangeable if the distribution of its adjacency matrix is invariant under finite permutation of any of its vertices. So how simply can such a distribution be generated? Is it enough to have a strict analog of Diffinetti, that is some parameter, which is a random variable measurable with respect to the sigma algebra and infinity? And the answer is no, even for dense graphs, there's a much larger space that characterizes exchangeable arrays. So the Aldous-Hoover theorem um, done in, <coughs> independently by Aldous and Hoover in 1979 and 81. And this is a reformulation of that theorem. It wasn't expressed in this way at that time. But we say that an infinite array is jointly exchangeable if and only if there is a probability measure mu on equivalence classes of dense graphons such that AIJ can be generated as follows. We choose a possibly random element of the equivalence class of dense graphons. And remember, the equivalence class um, is, uh, is up to measure preserving by, by jactions, okay? And then we choose our uniformly random infinite sequence and we connect i and j independently with this w. And while Diffinetti's theorem says that infinite exchangeable sequences are conditionally independent Bernoulli sequences with some random parameter p, which is measurable with respect to the sigma algebra at infinity, the oldest Hoover theorem says that jointly exchangeable arrays are just random dense graphons. Aldous Hoover was not expressed in this language. It was done 25 years before dense graphons were introduced, but um, uh, it, it can be, and the way we've stated it implicitly includes things like the Borg's, Chase, and Lovas result on the, uh, uh, on the uniqueness up to this measure preserving by bijection. So our sparse graph, so now we've done arrays, we've done dense 
or, 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 or we've done graphs and dense graphons, or sparse graphons associated with some exchangeable infinite process. Remember, what happened was that Bernoulli, it was that um, uh, Bernoulli sequences were, um, were associated with some parameter um, if they were jointly exchangeable, and um, dense graphons are associated with a jointly exchangeable array. So we went from a sequence to an array. Can we go to a process now? And the answer is not in the rescaled graphon theory, which is obtained by renormalizing the height of graphon one. But yes, if we define a projective sparse graphon process on an infinite sigma finite measure space and its corresponding edge process. So this was found simultaneously by uh, Christian Borg's Henry Cohn, Nina Holden and I and by Roy and Veitch, and it was inspired by a special case considered by Corone and Fox um, and related to general theorems of Kallenberg. So let's look at this exchangeable edge process. What I'm going to do is I'm going to consider a locally finite edge process. Locally finite means there are a finite number of points in, in, any, um, in, in any finite interval which can be viewed as the adjacency matrix of an infinite graph with vertices labeled by time. Okay, so I'm growing this graph and, and, um, and I have vertices that are labeled by time that are gonna appear on the horizontal and the vertical of the graph. And whenever an edge comes up between them, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put um, a corresponding dot by x and y and by y and x. Okay, and I'm going to let pg, and I'm going to put delta functions there, I'm going to let pg be the associated measure on r plus squared with point masses at the times corresponding to this, that the edges come in. And I say that the measure is jointly exchangeable if its distribution is invariant under finite interval permutations, it's enough to take a finite number of equal length intervals of time and jointly permute the rows and columns. So now what I'm going to do is reformulate left convergence for dense graphs. The idea is that I want to test a large graph from the left, so remember what we did from the left before was we looked at finite graphs and their homomorphisms into the big graph, which was essentially the same as looking at the subgraph density of those finite graphs. Now I'm going to do something very different. I'm going to choose x1 through xk iid from the vertex set, uniformly at random. And I'm going to output the induced subgraph, which I'm going to call sample sub k of g, i.e. the graph with the vertex set k and the edge set that came from the original graph. So I'm going to sample k points. And I say that a sequence of dense graphs is left convergent if the distribution of these k samples converges. So I'm taking samples of k vertices and the induced subgraph of the graph on those. And this is e equivalent to subgraph convergence, but now it's based on a process. So what is the limit of this? Well, we can say it's a collection of probability distributions on finite graphs, of course, these subgraphs. Um, and it's a projective collection of probability distributions on these, these k vertex subgraphs. Okay, so the distribution of the k minus first is equal to the induced subgraph of the kth one. So what happens is that as the process goes on, I am adding more vertices. Things are not changing in the way they changed when I 
rescaled the height of the graph, which was essentially like adding mass. And therefore, by Kolmogorov, I'm going to have an infinite random graph. So I have an infinite random random array. Right? An infinite random graph is an infinite random array. What are its properties? Well, the it's permutation, it's exchangeable, which has to do with the permutation invariance of the distribution for all permutations pi. It's also extremal. The probability of A cannot be written as a non-trivial convex combination of two different probability distributions on exchangeable arrays. And this follows from the fact that the subarrays of A on K cross K and its complement are independent by the sampling process. So what we're getting is that this limit of a left convergent sequence of dense graphs is an extremal exchangeable array. All this in Hoover, and I'm just going to repeat this slightly differently than the way I said it before, said that if um, if, if we have a symmetric, extremal, exchangeable array, then there exists a symmetric function such that A can be generated by first choosing x1, x2, etc., iid uniformly at random, and then by choosing aij Bernoulli with the coins being flipped according to the weight of this w function independently for all j. So the limit of a left convergent sequence GN is a symmetric function, and it's called a graph on, and we say that GN is left convergent to W. Okay, the notion of left convergence as subgraph counts went back to this early work of me and Christian Borges, Lotsi Lovas, Verashoj, and Kadi Vestragambi. The existence of a limit of the limiting graph on for a left convergent sequence of dense graphs was proved by Lovas and Segetti via the FK regularity um, lemma and Martingale convergence. The term graph on was coined by the five of us who started graph ons. Um, the above argument using the Aldous Hoover theorem to prove the existence of W as an alternative to the Lovas and, and Segetti, and they said it was essentially automatic from, uh, from Aldous Hoover, if you formulated Aldous Hoover right, was first given by Diaconis and Janssen and simultaneously by Tim Austin in 08. And then this, the new explicit formulation of left convergence in terms of sampling, where the argument is really automatic, was given um, by me and Christian Borgs, Henry Cohn, and Victor Veitch. So sampling convergence. So the idea is that we wanted to find graph limits via a sampling procedure, as I just did for you in the dense case, okay? And me and Henry and Victor went back and redid it in the dense case in that way, and then generalized it to the sparse case. So the expected number of edges in the sample is k choose 2 times the density of the graph, the edge density of the graph. So for sparse graphs, just like we were finding before with left convergence, the, the sample, um, the, the k samples of g are going to converge to the empty set, okay, to, to, to the empty graph. But, and here was the idea, Let's define a sampling process where k squared grows like 1 over rho. So as the density is going to 0, k is increasing. So I'm taking more and more points as the density is going to 0. And we call this Poisson sampling. And so to Poisson sample a graph, we consider it a Poisson process. Here of intensity p, which scales like t over, so scaled by, square root of twice the number of edges, okay? So if this were, you know, if, if we were in the case of a dense graph, this would just be t over n, 
but here it's t over square root of m. And we output the induced subgraph after deleting vertices. And with this choice, the expected number of edges, which is just the number of edges times the um, number of sample, the, the expected number of sam sample vertices, which is p squared, v squared, n squared, whatever you want to call it, is t squared over 2 uniformly in rho. Okay, so the expected number of edges is uniform in the density because we've been sampling more to make up for the fact that the density is going to zero. And now we define a sequence of graphs to be sampling convergent if and only if for all time, for all positive time, Poisson G converges in distribution. By compactness, any sequence of graphs has a subsequence that's sampling convergent. What is the limit of this? Well, it's a process of unlabeled graphs. So is there an analog of the Alvis Hoover theorem giving a more compact description of the process? So remember, for dense graphs, which are infinite exchangeable arrays, Aldous Hoover said, oh, this, this can be represented by, um, by a function, w, right? Just like Definetti said, I can represent um, an exchangeable sequence by a parameter. So would there be an analog to give a more compact description of the process and a preliminary answer, which I'll be then showing you how to do, is to extend the definition of graphons over processes um, and use the Poisson process basically to define a graphon process. So let's go through that. So graphon process, which we defined in um, uh, in work with um, Christian Borgs, Henry Cohn, and Nina Holden, and generalize the work of Coron and Fox. So we fix a measure space and a graph on. For t greater than zero, we let um, we 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 have points of our Poisson process with intensity t mu. We connect these with a probability w. So we flip our w weighted coin and we remove isolated vertices. So what am I doing here? Well, let's say that by time t1, I've output four points. By the way, if you're thinking about a network like, let's say Facebook, I am having people joining the network, okay? And the X's are characterizing their entire set of properties. I'm, you know, in, including all their latent properties. I'm representing that one-dimensionally here, but it's huge. And, um, and then I'm going to flip my weighted coin, and what's going to happen is that one, so I flip four, choose two, uh, 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 point one doesn't connect to anyone, point two connects to three, point two connects to four, but one doesn't connect to anyone. Now I go to a later time, T2, and, I'm, and I've generated three more points. Well, interestingly, what happens here is um, so we've got some point that connects also to two and four. Five doesn't connect to anyone, but point seven, when it flips its W weighted coins for the other six, it does connect to point one, which then shows up. So do all sampling convergent sequences converge to a graph? Well, we actually have to complete the space. So Victor Veitch and Dan Roy um, taught, de defined the notion of a graph X. Given a sigma finite measure space, an integrable graph X is a triple. First element of the triple is a symmetric function, W. It's an integrable graph on. The second element of the, of the graph on is an integrable function, s of x. And the third element is just a constant. And the norm of the graph x is the w 
you know, the, the, the um, L1 norm of the, the symmetric function, the L1 norm of the one variable function, and twice that, and twice this constant. And in this graph X process, we create a Poisson process of intensity T mu, just like we did before. We join I and J with this um, probability, just like we did before. Okay, but for each I, we also grow a star, Poisson T times S of XI. So I'm, if I'm thinking of XI as the features of um, of my uh, my 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 points, you really could think of this as a star. Somebody, uh, you know, a lot of people following someone on Twitter, um, and which is not a, a, which is a digraph, but still you can think of it that way. And independently add isolated edges at rate t squared times i. I remove all isolated vertices and I output the left graph. So the representation theorem we proved is that if gn is sampling convergent, then there exists a graph x of norm at most one, L1 norm at most one, such that in distribution, this sampling convergent graph can be characterized by this triple. Okay, so it's a very compact representation of a graph process. And the, the idea is to use Kallenberg's representation theorem for exchangeable random measures to prove that this is a graph X problem. For those of you who know Kallenberg's theorem, it has like 10 conditions on it. Interestingly, in some other work, which I'll mention just briefly, um, uh, with um, Suvik Dara and, um, and Sen, Christian Borgs and, and I, um, we proved that, uh, we, we found a counterexample to Kallenberg's theorem. One of the conditions was not right. Um, we changed the condition, and now the change Kallenberg theorem works. My guess is it works in a lot of cases. Um, in which it was used previously, but I don't know about all. So um, in the context of modeling sparse graphs, but not convergence, Kallenberg's theorem was first used by Perron and Fox in 2014, leading to rank one graph on processes. Roy and Veitch introduced the notion of a graph X and substantially generalized Perron Fox to show that a rather general class of sparse graphs can be modeled by this process. With Henry Cohn, um, Christian Morix, and Nina Holden, we defined graphons over arbitrary sig sigma, fi sigma finite feature spaces and studied both the graphon processes which were generated by these graphons and the question of convergence to such graphons. Um, in a version of the cut metrics corresponding to the stretching of empirical graphons. And finally, with Christian Moritz, Henry Hohn, and Victor Veitch, we introduced sampling convergence, established the above theorem, and showed that sampling convergence is equivalent to the convergence notion um, from the previous work with Nina Holden if there are not too many low degree versions. And so this is what the graph lands up looking like. We have a set of high degree vertices, S. Um, and this core, the core of high degree vertices is joined by edges, which generate a graph on. There are also high degree stars, which just have, you know, kind of fans hanging off them. And then there's a dust component of isolated edges. So how does this come about? Well, the heuristic picture is that we want to analyze this Poisson G and T, this sampling. Um, there are M edges and vertices are kept with probability T over square root of M. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to decompose V into a core of vertices of degree of order square root M, a low degree part with vertices of order little o square root N, and a high degree part of vertices of order omega root n. And then I'm going to sample with this probability p equals t over square root of m from these three. Okay? And cp 
LP and HP are the subsets after sampling. So H contains of order square root of m vertices, little o, sorry, square root of m vertices, because otherwise we would have too many edges. Um, and so it's got to be empty. If C contains little o square root of m vertices, then it will be empty as well. If it has theta square root of m vertices, then CP is going to contain P times theta of N, so that's of order T vertices in expectation, each of expected de degree T. And the probability that vertex I in L has degree greater than 2, um, after sampling, what, what we'll get is we'll get P cubed times DI squared, so little o of p squared di, hence an expectation, the number of vertices, and it's a simple, it's a simple calculation. We have to do things carefully and you know can control errors. That's also little o one. So L is only going to have degree one vertices. So after sampling, yes, this has degree one. In the limit, the edges with two vertices in LP are going to have two endpoints with degree one, and thus the isolated edges contributing to I. Those between LP and CP will be the stars. These are just the fans hanging off. And those with both endpoints in the core, C, of P will, C sub P will contribute to the graph. So um, sketch of the proof, which is not very different than the heuristics I just gave you, and it really does put a lot of things under the rug still. So maybe I will actually skip that because that's not, um, probably don't have time for that. Um, I want to mention one other result. You might rem remember that with Christian Borges and Latte Lovas in 2010, we proved that the um, that the graphon, the dense graphon, was unique up to measure preserving bijection. And so up to that e equivalence, we could identify the graph, the graphon. This time, working with Lotzi Lovas Jr. in a much more complicated proof, the, the paper's over 100 pages, um, can we determine W on the underlying space? Can we do something similar? And so it turns out that given two sigma finite measure spaces and a measure preserving map and a graph on the pullback of W under phi is just as you would expect. It's a pullback of the one, um, one variable function and a pullback of the two variable function. And given a graph X, I say that its degree support is defined by um, S of that of of the 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 X's for which the star weight at that point and the integral of all other edges into that point is positive, and the following turn out to be to 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 be equivalent. If the restriction of W and W prime to their su de degree supports are pullbacks of a third graphon, then the two graph or of a third graph x, then the two graph x's are equal. So that is the the uniqueness. It's up to this very um, complicated notion of being um, of pulling the two back. Um, to their 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 degree supports and having them both be the pullbacks of a of another. Okay, so here's the summary. We have graphs, we do a sampling limit, and we get a graph X, and from that we can generate random graph models. Dense graphs, we have metric convergence, left convergence, right convergence, rescaled convergence for sparse graphs. Um, gives us theories of limits as well as estimation, which I did not cover here. And sampling convergence generalizes left convergence to sparse graphs. 
Graph X is consisting of a graph on a star and isolated edges are the completions of graph on, are, are, are the completions of this process under sampling convergence and they give us new non-parametric models of sparse graphs. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jennifer. So this session ends now and uh, there won't be time for questions. So let's thank Jennifer again for her wonderful talk. Thank you.